Okay. Uh, yeah, no worries. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you, Professor Florence, for your presentation. Uh, we've uh, we've, uh, we've uh, made this uh, presentation based on a previous paper that she wrote in 2017, I think. Uh, so it's titled Conflicts in the Calculation and Use of Price Index, the Case of France. So I'll present the hist historical part first, try to paint a uh, clearer picture. She sort of ran through most of the things, but this will also help to give a better idea of what we're talking about. So since the 1950s, the Index of General Evolution of Prices, CPI, has been one of the uh, macroeconomic indicators most closely watched by national governments. The CPI has become a highly influential factor in wage negotiations. Uh, is used in, ma in wage indexation, so things such as minimum uh, welfare payments, minimum wage pensions. And the article that we uh, read tried to explore the internal conventions of, uh, of it and the sometimes muted disputes around the calculation and the use of this particular price aggregate, particularly in France. So the CPI was first developed in the early days of national accounts and official statistics uh, in the 1910s, but it did not become fully established as an indicator until the late uh, the infl inflationary periods of the 1950s and then the 1970s. So the challenges have always had to do. Yeah, so the challenges have always had to do uh, to different degrees with the distribution, so the effects of the CPI on purchasing power of wage earners and the representation of uh, wealth. So. Um, the first period, so uh, she, mentioned, she mentioned INSEE, which is the uh, National Institute of uh, Statistics and Economics, uh, study, Economical Studies. So uh, there are different ways of sort of, or there are different ways historians or economic historians sort of uh, say when uh, CPI started or how it started. So uh, according to uh, NC statistician, John Roche, he sees that the use US financial crisis in 1907 as a starting point for the development and the use in official statistics of an aggregate price index. So the first price indexes were conceived as an indirect measure of the representation of economic activity. It was only after World War I when prices quadrupled that quantifying inflation was really contemplated. Inflation became a public concern at that point in France. Uh, the first indices were created for wholesale prices, later on retail prices, and then producer prices. So various modes of data collection succeeded this generic definition over time, marking out the path towards a price index that was aiming for a form of exhaustiveness. As you'll see from the first generation all the way to the now ninth generation, they include more and more things. Uh, as the table later suggests, yeah, that's exactly what I just talked about. So we mentioned the last part, say, fixed uh, base uh, index. So it, it, this was the index that was adopted in France and uh, in the US as well. It was, it was uh, practical, as it was the less complicated and cheaper method to d depict the evolution of prices. Uh, the other reason uh, was that this was very, uh, it, was, it was a theoretical reason, so the prominent statistician at the time in the early 1900s, Lucien Marsh, uh, was quoted as saying the price index, which is to say a costing of a uniform lifestyle, is understood not, its in, not in, in its ordinary sense, but in a sense that will measure precisely the effects of changes in the prices of things, independently of the changes in habits or taste, or of an increase in differenti differentiation of needs. Um, post Bo Boskin, so this is the report uh, that she mentioned in the 1996, uh, on measuring inflation received considerable media attention both in the US and internationally. Uh, extensive media coverage of the Boskin report was directly related to quantification of the differences between calculation of the price indexes using the then current method and the calculation by the method advocated by economists with a view to make it of a more cost of living index. Uh, the major sources of bias that the report uh, identified related to the handling of substitution and the purchase of goods, the increasingly frequent uh, introduction of new goods into the market baskets, and the idea of better reflecting the quality of what is consumed, that calculations of price index should be reformed in order to, over, uh, to reduce the overestimates. Um, next was the Maastricht Treaty, so in 1992, with the establishment of the current union, and which led to the uh, single currency, laid down the convergence of criteria with which uh, member states had to comply before and after integration. So since such coordination was very difficult to establish while member states had different statistical systems, from 1996, Eurostat produced the Harmonized CPI, the HCPI. So this index was fixed by regulation and constructed on the basis of prices, data collected by different uh, member states. The, HSB, uh, the HCPI was also adopted by the ECB as an indicator of price stability. 
Uh, the arrival of the euro in, the, in 2002 in France had a variety of effects on French households, so among which was the fraying of confidence in the currency. And this lessened credibility of the official index, uh, not just in France, soon led to the, in 2004, a revision of the economic surveys of the households. And the, these surveys uh, revealed a distinct gap through, throughout Europe between perceived inflation and inflation as, an objectified, as objectified in official statistics. So statisticians from the British office uh, at the time showed how personal inflation can vary depending on individual social and demographic profile. In France, NCA undertook the same type of project in the first quarter of 2007, drawing directly from uh, the same type of experiment that had happened in Germany. So it put a simulator online, making it accessible to anyone with an internet you who could have access to the internet. In doing so, the statistical office were trying to meet several objectives at the time, so they wanted to satisfy the individual consumer, settle broader con uh, controversies re related to the CPI, help rebuild the legitimacy of the index, and add legitimacy to the notion that a cost of living index would be more appropriate. And then finally, I'll just, there are, di there are the different generations of the French uh, CPI. I won't go through them all, but I'll compare the first one uh, in 1914. The, there were 34 items indexed. Uh, the reference population was working class families with four persons, two children. The geographic uh, coverage was Paris, and the basket was uh, made up of 29 food items, four heating slash lighting items, one cleaning product or maintenance product. But when you go to the eighth generation, 2015, the index base was based on 1,100 pro product families known as varieties. The reference population was all households. The geographic coverage was 99 towns with more than 2,000 inhabitants, and the basket of goods coverage was uh, roughly 27% of all goods and services. Next, I'll pass it on to all of you. Okay, so when we read this paper, we figured that there's like three kind of key themes. So the first was the historical narrative, the second was um, kind of the social conflicts and the conflicting claims regarding how to estimate the inflation. And that's what I'm going to talk about, and then when Jan is going to talk about like the problems regarding estimating inflation, like the technical aspects. But um, yeah, so as Professor explained, uh, the CPI can be seen as a statistical fiction, so kind of a social construct that that develops uh, as like different social groups and forces struggle over how it should be estimated. And uh, when you mentioned that you apply the ideas from uh, the regulation school, everything kind of clicked because you didn't mention that in the paper, but now now it all makes sense, like the framework that you apply. Um, I didn't do it at that time, but I'm now doing it more directly. Okay. At the reason why. And I think it fits well. 2015 and 17 is far away from now. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think um, the CPI became especially popular during the uh, 70s when the stagflation crisis happened. And it was used to discipline national governments in the 80s and 90s, uh, particularly related to the Maastricht Treaty. Um, and then when the US suspended the dollar's convertibility into gold in 1971, that was when the CPI became especially important because the notion of a market type of symbolic money became prevalent in economics and in the economy more, more generally. Um, and yeah, the reason why it's such a key issue is because it is used to adjust the purchasing power of wage earners and uh, other like people who receive uh, social security payments and stuff. Of course, less now, but more, more in, in the past. Um, and therefore, it is a central locus of political economic struggles. Um, yeah, so basically, this means that wage earners had, and some still do, but they, they have an interest to kind of overestimate it or estimate it higher, and then the employers and others, other kinds of similar, other similar kinds of um, actors have an interest to estimate it lower. And then there are some other, like some financial instruments, such as the TIPS, which is, uh, I think, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. So they are assets whose value is um, protected against inflation. So I guess those kinds of act like the actors who own those kinds of securities also have an interest in um, kind of overestimating inflation, but maybe that's not at the core of this. Um, oh yeah, let's skip that. And then, yeah, the Boskin report that was already explained, but basically in 1996, uh, it was published and it argued that inflation had allegedly been overestimated by 1.3% per year for the past 10 years. Um, and then I think it was one of the interviews of your paper who said that this was the political project since the 50s to show that it has been overestimated. And this was in the US. Um, and yeah, there was one researcher, I think his name was, uh, name was uh, John Williamson or something, who said that 
he, sh he showed that um, if, they, if we apply the kind of estimate that was first used, then we sh see that um, inflation would be much higher. But then, yeah, I think that was the point. Shadow stat. Mm. The shadow oh, yeah. stat. Yes. yes. And then um, I think the initial response of the INSEE was kind of less radical and more nuanced. So they were kind of like undermining the arguments. But then there were some economists who argued, like Clerk, Clerk and Coudon, mm -hmm. who argued that in France, the overestimation of inflation amounted to 3% per year in 1974 81 and 1% 1 per year in 1981 94. So that's even like higher than what the Boskin report said. Mm. And yeah, then we have the master criteria. So this makes things maybe a bit more complex because like before this, I think the em emphasis in the paper was um, more on like the direct kind of distributional conflicts between employers and wage earners and stuff. But I think, yeah, here, here, we, here, here we have like more indirect kind of effects and mechanisms. Uh, but basically, in the 90s, when the Maastricht Treaty was signed, uh, the EU needed like a statistical estimate of inflation that could like account for all the member states and new member, member states. And therefore, they uh, created the harmonized CPI. CPI. Um, and then what is interesting is that when um, the EU and when the states uh, organized like household surveys, they found out that people estimated the rate of inflation to be around six percentage points higher than what the official estimate said in 2004, 2010. Um, yeah, and then around this time, the, uh, the um, statistic organizations, they also uh, introduced these kinds of, yeah, what RF said, these kinds of uh, individual price calculators. So you could like calculate your own price index and stuff like that. Um, and that was related, I think, that, that was your argument that it, it was related to this kind of a hegemonic concep concep conception of uh, humans as hyper-rational individuals and also this new kind of uh, neoliberal mode of self-governance so people could check for themselves they didn't rely on the uh, kind of centered estimate as it were, or centralized. Um, and then in the two uh, 2010s, the INSC started using cash register slash scan scanner data from the retail chains. Um, yeah, and this, this can be seen um, as something that results from the INSC, INSEE trying to yeah, cut spending, but also trying to seem like a big data innovator. And that kind of turned the tables on the INSEE because it was now the one that was being measured by the private interests. And then finally, we have the issue of quality regarding uh, social conflicts, uh, like conflicting claims over how to estimate inflation. So quality is a key issue because quality is yeah, like Professor explained, it is a, also like a subjective thing that, and there's many ways to estimate it and how should we estimate it, how should we, whose interpretation of quality we should use. And before, I, before we move on from my section, I, I think that kind of the general argument of the paper is that when we move through time, our estimates of inflation, like they tend to uh, like estimate inflation less or estimate it to be less than before. And I was thinking about this uh, in the case of the harmonized uh, consumer price index. I know because you don't, you don't say like this directly, but I got the idea or understanding that like the harmonized consumer price index would also underestimate or like estimate inflation to be less. So, and we, we should talk about this like when we have the Q&A part, but uh, I, I kind of checked how it is in France the euro area, US and Finland. So this is like the graph that summarizes the differences. So we have France, euro area, US and Finland. I'm Finnish, so that's why. <laughs> that's, that's the only reason. It's not, a, it's not a global superpower, it's a small country, but, which is interesting for me. Um, interesting. So I checked, uh, I calculated inflation rates in these countries using uh, the harmonized index and the consumer price index, and then I took the difference between those two, just like the percentage point difference. Um, so if this difference is negative, it means that the harmonized index um, kind of yeah, estimates it to be lower, and if it's positive, it estimates it to be higher. Um, 
So basically, if we only look at France and the euro area, is there somewhat similar? We see that for the most part, they are positive. So it means that the harmonized consumer price index estimates inflation to be higher than the consumer price index. When we look at the US, it's more difficult to say because here, before the financial crisis, it tends to be positive, mostly. But then after the financial crisis, it falls and it's mostly negative. And that's, that's really interesting as well. And then, I don't know what is going on in Finland. Like, I have no idea. Because it's just like, it like, yeah, it has its own life. And this is partly because uh, in 2009, like, according to the consumer price index, there was no inflation, it was zero. But then according to the harmonized index, it was, yeah, close to 1.6%, I think. And, yeah, we will have four questions at the end, but this is, this is one of the questions, so maybe you could try to interpret this for us. I know it's a lot, but uh, this would be really interesting to hear what you think about this. Um, but yeah, now we'll move on to the next one. So the other part of the paper also explains the um, technical problems of the measuring um, price index, especially for the price statistics, in this case, the INC in France. Uh, for instance, especially uh, the continuous um, innovation has caused the uh, product to renew constantly and uh, the difficulty to measure the service activities, also the so-called uh, durable goods and the term of uh, free goods and services, especially one of the most important thing here is the issue of quality, which we will come back later in the ne uh, next slide. And also the INC, they also need to deal with the pricing policy, for example, the yield the management, which the professor also mentioned, that the, uh, it's a special price strategy based on the consumer's willingness to pay. And so what has caused these um, problems, uh, the complexity and uh, uh, difficulty? As always, we need to go back to history, um, to the uh, 40s era um, during the 1940s to 1970s, especially in the Western Europe and uh, uh, North America. Um, in that period, the mass production and the consumption was popular. Um, also, the concept of uh, output has been linked to standard and the manufactured units of constant utility, and the ma macroeconomic aggregate was introduced and used in that period. But um, the massification, the concept of massification, still suitable for today or not? which professor also answered up, obviously not. Um, here are some uh, imperfect realities here. Um, for instance, the uh, transformation from traditional manufacturing to the more sophisticated, the special uh, service business, business, the special intangibles, blah, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Those factors were not considered when the period of uh, forgery era that uh, the uh, statistical construction was uh, built which leads to our next question of uh, quality. Um, quoted from the paper that, as it happens, quality is the inextricable in, in result of the perception of the producers, the subjective perception of the consumer, and also <coughs> norms, collective standards, laws, and uh, hidden conventions, which we can understand that quality can be considered as the uh, collective federation by different uh, social actors. And back to history again, equality by that time was first taken into account by inflation measurements adopted in the US, but, uh, in the trade union, and uh, by that time inflation was considered as underestimated because of the quality of the goods has been going down due to the war. Um, second part of the quality is how to measure quality, which we have to mention the very infamous um, method of the hedonic method, which was proposed by Andrew Court in 1938. That we, if we use the hedonic method, we can um, com decompose the different characteristics of the goods and uh, uh, measure the quality and price accordingly. Uh, and thanks to uh, due to the um, convenience and econometric uh, econometric uh, um, characteristic of the method, it was uh, adopted by many in time. However, that's still not all, the whole picture that we can see here, the high cost of the compelling constitute characteristics, and it's also more trickier to be used in intangible goods and also the credibility of uh, hedonic goods. 
based on those issues, we turn to the second part of the INC in terms of their um, uh, their uh, strategy in the um, uh, adapting uh, adapting uh, uh, indicators. That first of all, the uh, durability of the goods, which in a more um, broader sense, that the, abs the absence of environmental considerations, for example, uh, in the agricultural products and the goods, the statisticians, the uh, the, the statisticians production, uh, sorry, the production growth of the agriculture products and the goods are based on the sacrification, for example, on the people's hairs. And why is this the case? Part of the answer is based on the statisticians. That most of the case, they um, you, uh, they employ the hedonic method to uh, measure the quality based on the product producers um, producers uh, reaction instead of taking more account of the consumer's perspective. We, that's why we call them the biased statisticians. And uh, in this case, some of the economics that they propose the uh, so-called consumer utility, utility index CUI to solve the problem, they claim they have been succeeding to solve the problem. But what, on the one hand, yes, indeed, the, it looks like a more uh, concrete term by replacing the conventional vague quality term. And uh, it does relate to the cost of living index and by taking into account of the consumer utility. But on the other hand, it's still in the mainstream economic group, um, regime that uh, during the CPI and also quoted by the professor in uh, the paper that uh, it, does nothing, it does nothing to do, does nothing much to do with the sustainable and well-being. And uh, by the end of the day, that uh, there's still no uh, perfect uh, me uh, measurement of the price index. And this is our question part. <laughs> yeah, the questions are uh, longer. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we'll start with the easiest one. I had so uh, many things to say already. <laughs> <laughs> but you've already no answered. Questions. Yeah, you've sort okay. of already answered the first one because yeah, yeah, uh, okay. you showed a ninth generation uh, okay. CPI. But maybe I could ask you what you think the tenth generation would look like, and maybe the role of big data in in the in this new CPI. And uh, yeah, this is a long one, so I'll, I'll just read it. Um, the paper shows that the struggle, struggles over how high or low inflation should be estimated were directly related to political economic actors, interest and debate before the Maastricht Treaty. So this is highlighted in the paper. Um, conversely, after the treaty, the focus is less on these direct economic interests and more on the effects of neoliberal self-governance and austerity on the price index. So the question is, how do you see the traditional slash direct economic interests and actors influencing the price index after the Maastricht Treaty and today? Mm. And then the second question is, um, yeah, the paper, paper, paper deals with the issue of inflation, but it's a study, it's kind of a meta study, as it were, and it doesn't discuss different theories of, or concepts of, uh, conceptions of inflation. So we were wondering, what do you think about the relationship between different slash conflicting theories of inflation on the one hand, and the debates mm -hmm. concerning how inflation should be estimated on the other? Is there any like effect? Mm -hmm. So like thinking about like the quantity theory of money, the mm -hmm. um, new consensus model, conflicting claims, the post Keynesian conflicting claims theory, and yeah, some Marxian theories maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, and then and my question is more about the measurement of the price index that. Uh, how would you explain the greater hedonic methods in terms of the well-being? Also, you mentioned the inequality program and the sustainable society. More specifically, uh, on the one hand, constant utility index, CUI, is popularly used in the mainstream economic research. On the other hand, a large group of statisticians use the hedonic method to measure the so-called so quality based on the quantity and uh, volume way. So by the end of the day, what should be done to make the hedonic approach more adaptable in the real economics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for all these questions. Some of them I still uh, want to, to 
I, I race to myself every morning when I wake up, so on which I don't have the, the answers yet, but some of them on which I have some answers. Maybe I, I can tell you a few things to start with, uh, listening to your, to your presentations, and Ruth, I, I warmly thank you for that because it was uh, hard work and, uh, and you did it very well. So that's to be sure you'll have nice mark. Uh, but but, the, but the, the papers I wrote was in 2017, and since then I, I, I made really many, many presentations of, 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 of this research. And I changed a few things, and it's the, the, the first part were interesting because I, I had forgotten that I spoke about what happened in 1907, for instance. And uh, okay, or this was a sort of a going back to my own history. So, the, the latest book is Palgrave Macmillan, 2021. If some of you are interested in maybe 2017, Cambridge Journal of Economics is interesting, but the, 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 the latest book is, is Palgrave Macmillan, 2021. And I, I changed some stuff, probably, um, which were not completely stabilized at this time. I want to, to, to maybe do some correction, some factual correction. Um, uh, the CPI is not produced by the national accounts in no countries, neither in the United States, at least, nor in France. In, in the United States, it's produced by the Bureau of Labor Statistics and not by the BEA the BEA producing the national accounts. So this is quite interesting because you have the GPI, uh, you have the, the GDP produced on the one hand, you have the national account on the one hand, and they, they borrow the, the, the inflation rate and then they use it for the deflator, but from another department. And they don't really connect to each other and they don't really converse with each other, they don't discuss with each other, they just import it. So this is also something which is quite interesting. So the national accounts just import the data from the, from the, the social data department in France. Uh, the, 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 I, I would like also to stress some stuff concerning the overestimation and underestimation. And maybe this will be part of one of the questions which has be, been raised. I would say today that mostly the people who speak about an overestimations, overestimation are the central banks, the, 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 the ONS uh, general directors here in France Tavernier, which is something completely new because normally sort of a became nat natural or even defend the production of its uh, department and he's himself criticizing saying hmm, most economists say that it is, uh, uh, the, the, the inflation rate is overestimated, so I, I agree with them, which is sort of a, 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 a rupture in the loyalty with its own department. So this is very, very important. So the central bank, the Fed, Boskin, Aguillon, all these people and all the economists, except the heterodox, on we, but the heterodox say nothing concerning this question, but all these people say that, or if really make a pressure uh, on the idea that, that the inflation is probably overestimated or is overestimated with the quantification that you, you gave. So this is interesting because it helps us understand where are the economic interests also. And on the other hand, the underestimation is defended by the trade unioners and sometimes by alternative economists, but, but very few, and sometimes by the uh, Association of Consumers. But what is interesting also the, is that I've been working on that for the last seven, seven years. I've never heard any employer, federation or union, etc., saying anything concerning the the, the price index. They just, they are not part of the debate, except, except maybe in some countries, but in France, they are not part of the, 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 the debate. The MEDEF, which is the, the biggest uh, uh, employer uh, union, has, to my point, to my knowledge, said nothing concerning this point. So, so this is also something that may be interesting to, to know. M maybe I can also stress on one point. There, you should make a difference but I understand I, why you probably mix the two. You should make a difference between 
the measurement of the perception of inflation, which is something which is really standardized. And the, the question which is raised is, uh, would you say over the last year that inflation has increased, remained stable or decreased? Mm -hmm. And then they make a sort of a uh, equation of this. So you, I don't think you could say that, for instance, the perception is six point higher then I think it's wrong. It's a wrong way of uh, interpreting the graphs that are in the paper. It's not a question of, of six points higher. It's just far higher, but we don't know of what, what, what is the, the gap in a way. Um, so, so this is the perception measurement. And the simulator is something different. The simulator has been introduced first in Germany, then in Great Britain, and then in France. It's a personal simulator. If you want to play with it, it's on the website, and you can calculate your own inflation rate. So it's a, it's a way of, of being in rupture, which was, I called at the beginning of my, of my presentation, a collective cognitive device. If we, if we have this simulator spread over, it is the end of these statistics being collective cognitive device, because now, each of us can calculate our individual in inflation. And what could it mean? It could mean, if you, if, you, if you are a bit extreme or radical, it could mean that within a few years, each of you go and negotiate your increase of wage on an individual basis, because you may say that your inflation rate is of X percent or Y percent, etc. But the, it, then it's a rupture because it's not a collective information anymore. It's not a class information anymore. And these simulators tend to spread over. You have simulators to calculate your own uh, retirement level, for instance. You can calculate your own retirement level when you're a civil servant. You can calculate today your, uh, the, 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 the purchasing power France Info has published a, a simulator, individual simulator for that, et cetera, et cetera. So it's something, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a, it's, it's part of the neoliberalism for me, a structure and, and development. And the last thing I wanted to say, um, um, oof, um, okay, now I go back to the questions. Maybe I, I tackle with the first one, which is the, the harmonized consumer price index. Um, as you showed you, you, uh, yourself, I mean, it's not always underestimated. It depends. And we cannot, we have no straightforward trend between the difference between the HCPI and the, the harmonized CPI and the national CPI. Uh, if I had, if I had seen an, an, a structural under or overestimation, I would have stressed on. But as you mentioned and show, it, it depends over time. Sometimes it's over, but it can sometimes be lower also. So it depends, yeah. Yeah, but for instance, for the, uh, positive in which sense? The HCPI is higher or lower? Uh, is higher. Yeah. Okay. Then, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and one, uh, the the main reason is the uh, difference in in the calculation of the HCPI, and the HCPI make a difference between, for instance, for the public goods, a difference between the gross price, le prix brut, and the net price. Either you take into account the price that you pay out of your pocket or the price which is, uh, which is uh, presented on the packet for, the, so for health and especially for the drugs. And this is the, one of the main difference. So I would not say that there is any, I would not say that there is any economic interest behind that. I would not say that, but, but, but I, may be, I may be wrong and this will be, will be linked to another uh, issue which I will uh, stress on later. Um, the ninth generation of, uh, of, of, of the ninth ger generation, I would say, is the, is the big data, is what has been introduced in, in 2020. And at the, so uh, INSEE introduced that uh, to be um, modern, in a way, 
uh, to be modern, yeah, to, to say that it was capable of, uh, of, 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 in, of introducing big data in its own process. They also said that it would uh, lower the costs, and in fact it has increased very much the costs. It has lowered the, the labor costs, but that it has increased the equipment costs very, very much, because when you use the big data, you have to have intensive equipment of uh, computers and really big, big equipments of computers. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that they've had to generate new contracts with marketing agencies because one of the big issue concerning the big data, it's another big, one of the issue concerning big data is the fact that they are relying on the code bar, barcode, okay thank you, on the barcode and the barcode is affected with very very low level of description on what the good is about. Very, very low description. You have some element of what the good is about, but very low. So if, we want, if you want to compare the code bar over time, and if you want to be sure that it is of equivalent quality over time, you need to rely on other information, and this information, you buy them to these marketing agencies, Who's, which is, and it's one of their jobs to do this. So they have the code bars and they make, uh, they make descriptions. So it's a sort of a privatization of the process <coughs> because up to now, the collector of the prices was on the ground and was collecting the description and was trying to figure out if the quality was changing over time or not. Now they rely on these agency, marketing agencies and they pay very much for that. So it's also a process of privatization, and this I have uh, written on a, on a recent paper, not on the book, but on a recent paper. Um, the conception uh, of inflation, which is behind, this is interesting. Each time I, I had an interview, I always ask my, uh, the people I was uh, interviewing, and I was telling them at the end of the discussion, at the very end, before leaving, I was telling them, but what is your, uh, your own representation of inflation? Is it more a quantitative, monetary representation, etc., at, at, at à la Friedman, or is it something which is closer to, uh, to um, uh, either realistic or, let's say, a post Keynesian way of, of, of saying inflation with uh, you know, str the question of struggling, etc.? And most of the time, they were really honestly telling me. I have no idea. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I have no idea because I'm not interested in the question of the phenomenon itself. So this is also something which is interesting, and this is one way of, of going back to the to to the issue of uh, policies, uh, economic policies. But this is something I'm I'm, I'm less uh, uh, at ease with, but which interests me. What are the political consequences? of an underestimation or of an overestimation. To be sure, when it's underestimated, or if it was underestimated, it would mean that there is a, a, a purchasing, a, a, a redu reduction in purchasing power. And this may explain the reason why the, um, the, the, the trade unioners just push, want to push the inflation rate up, or the inflation index, not rate, but index up. Not rate, but index up. We, we agree on that. So this is this way. But if it is underestimated, this means that concerning the uh, official um, uh, European um, Central Bank uh, policy, it would mean that uh, it's... Uh, they sort of don't want to increase the interest rate that much because the inflation is lower than it should be. So it sort of uh, tend to, to, to reduce the interest rate in a way. And this is more favorable for the, uh, well, if you are a post keynesian it it, it's regarded as being something good. So this may explain I'm not sure. But this also be part of the story of the reason why the HCPI, 
might be overestimated, as you said, at least cons uh, compared to the national uh, inflation rates. Because if this is so, I mean, we know that the BCI, uh, the, 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 the central bank, uh, I, I should not say that they like to increase the interest rate, but they are neutral concerning this question. So, and this may explain why they, they, they so maybe concerning the, the, the central bank, they are increasing the interest rates more because the, sh the harmonized CPI is higher than the CPI, but, but at the same time, so you, have, you may have sort of a neutralization of the two. So obviously, if this is the case, it's less interesting and less stimulating to have such a discussion. But at the same time, uh, it's, I think that now I have to, 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 how to say that? I have to, I have to explore more in detail what is, uh, what is, um, is, uh, is under discussion at the, the, the European Central Bank. And this is the next step of my research, is to, to have a look at it. But I think that there is a, there is a sort of trade-off between uh, the, the decrease in the purchasing power on the one hand and a sort of decrease of the interest rate on the other, which may compensate in a way this, this element. But this doesn't explain why Philippe Aguillon, you know Philippe Aguillon? No, you're not French. Because <laughs> if, if you were French, you, you would know who he, who he is because he is everywhere. And Philippe Aguillon is one of the French leader concerning the fact that inflation is, is, he doesn't say maybe it is, is overestimated. And the reason he put forward, the official reason he put forward is the fact that uh, we do not take into account sufficiently the digital increase in quality. So he's fascinated by the digi digital. So he thinks that the digital is always an increase in quality, which is something we may discuss about. Mm -hmm. Is it always the case? Not sure, but let's, okay. And, uh, and but, but, but the main argument he has, which come back to the reason why I discussed this question and I, I explored the, 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 this research, is he says that if the inflation is overestimated, growth is underestimated. And this is why he speaks about uh, uh, the missing growth. He speaks about the missing growth. He thinks that the growth should be higher than it is today. And it should be higher of uh, one point per year. So we sort of uh, would live in an imaginary uh, society. But it's interesting because, I mean, I mean, all things are connected. We should connect the question of inflation, obviously, with the question of interest rate, but also with the question of growth. So my, my next point, my next step, but I would need some people to help me to do that, is to sort of uh, do uh, different narratives. A narrative with uh, taking into account seriously the fact that inflation is underestimated. What, what impact does it, this has on political economies, on, 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 on politics, and on, on economic policies? And what, what, it should be, what would be the narrative if... Um, if the inflation was overestimated. And I tried, but, but sometimes, I, sometimes not enough, I tried to sort of be symmetric. I'm more interested in the actors who push one argument instead of, 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 of being part of the discussion. Let me say a uh, last point, sorry. So sorry I'm I yes, sorry, sorry. Question. It's the question of the environment or the ecological issue. May say a few things, con one thing concerning the ecological issue. Yeah, so we need to stop in 10 minutes. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, concerning ec the ecological the issue, uh, I cannot say that it is not taken into account, but it is taken f up to now within the big issue of quality. So when, when the quality, when the en ecological quality is regulated, it is taken into account. For instance, you have different categories when you buy a, a refrigerator. Your category A, B, C, D, E, and these categories depend on the uh, uh, gas emissions. Then it's taken into account, because if you have a, a, a refrigerator B and, and then if, if, if it shifts to A, it would be regarded as being an increase in quality. But, but very often it's not the case, because when it's not regulated, if the 
if the producer does not say anything concerning the, 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 the ecological issue, then it's not taken into account. And I remember in one of my interviews, and this is my last sentence, a guy was telling me, obviously in the 19s, in the 1990s, we as statisticians, when the tomatoes were available every month during the year, we were regarding it as being an increase in quality. And it would not be the case today. So this is the reason why I say that quality is something which is also uh, situated in time and situated specially. And what is regarded as being quality at a moment of uh, time is not regarded as being, a, may not be regarded as being a quality at another period of time. I take questions. Okay, super. Uh, here, here, here. <laughs> Hi, Professor, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I come from Argentina, and something that is very common in, in countries like mine or Venezuela, and I think also in China, is the phenomenon of, of shrinkflation. Yeah. And I would like to know if this might be under the, the explanation of an underestimated inflation, and if you think that the CPI in France is able to capture it, this phenomenon? Um, <coughs> oh. Uh, I, I wanted to put back my 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 own presentation, but I don't know how to to do. Maybe can, so, can someone can come here? Okay, the shrinkflation is something very very easy to understand. Is the fact that if you want to to have the strategy of of, of putting of having the prices at the same level, you you play you play on the quantity. So shrinkflation is you maintain the price, but you lower the quantity. So for instance, instead of having a, a, a yogurt, a five, 500 grams of yogurt, you have only 480 grams of yogurt. It's minus 4% of quantity, and you have an incre a, a stabilization of price. But this shrinkflation is something that is very common. It's, it's, it's more important today because of, of, of the increase of inflation. But it has, it's something that has always existed. And the, the statistical office know how to handle with it. But sometimes they, they have some difficulties. For instance, when they have to look at the fact that the tea bags may have in each of the tea bags either 4 grams or 3.5 grams, which is a huge difference. But sometimes they don't see it. And obviously, they, the producer won't stress on the fact that they decrease the quantity. So they have to be very trained for that, okay? to, uh, to, to know where to look at. But this shrinkflation is something that has no consequence, normally no consequence. Which has more consequence is the fact that in very, very many different situations of consumption, you don't know what is a unit of quantity in the services. What is a, I mean, I have no price today. I come here pri priceless, but, but, uh, and, and, and free. But, but you know, for, what is the quantity of what I'm doing today? I mean, my, my, the, the production of, of, of teachers, of, of, the, of, of surgery, etc. You don't know what a, what a unity is exactly. You don't, you cannot count in terms of quantity. And the variation of quantity is something completely, I mean, it's, it's really tricky. It, and, 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 and they have many difficulties. So this is more important than the shrinkflation, which is more or less handled. But, but, but I, I, I have a new concept, which is a cheapflation. The fact that, that, that there is a degradation of quality, not of quantity, but a degradation of quality with, an in, with a stability in price. Okay, so two last questions. Thank you, Professor, very much. Um, first, a very fast comment. I found amazing your, your work because you are working with interviews and this is not common in economics at all. And you are discussing literally philosophy of science. Yeah? You are attacking how something's measured and I found it amazing how you found this in economics. It's so great. Moving to the question. But you know some economists uh, handle with the uh, interviews. I'm not the only one. Oh yeah. In heterodoxy, it's, uh, it's, we defend this idea of, 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 of using this methodology to combined with other materials and other quantities, but, uh, oh, uh, okay. Yes, um, Sorry. Yes, yeah, for the question very fast. Okay, how, so you said it can be underestimated or overestimated. Yeah. 
So is there a way, correct way? I don't think you would say that there's a correct way, but then I'd like to know your opinion. How you think should, so how you think we should measure it? Like okay. what are the things should be fixed? That's a very good question, very, very good. Okay, I try to become neutral in this strong conflict over the idea of overestimation and underestimation. So that's the first point. And, and I try to, get, to keep this symmetry because, because I try to analyze the controversies. And if you want to analyze a controversy, and if you want to do it on a scientific basis, obviously you have to, you have, as much as you can, you have to, to keep a sort of neutrality, otherwise you, you won't manage. But, first but, I have two buts. But obviously, obviously, what I notice is the fact that there are people with far more power than others over this question of overestimation and underestimation. In the 70s, trade unions were very, very strong. Today, they are very, very weak and they don't, they don't invest in this question anymore. They don't involve this question anymore and they are losing the game in a way. So obviously when I speak in this way, it means that um, probably I think that today it's, it, it might be a bit higher than it is. But, but I try, you know, scientifically I try, I'm more interested in knowing who, what are the forces in the debate than, than having a point of view myself. And I think I wanted to answer something else, but what was your last point? It's because I, w I think for us, for policy makers, like, yeah. uh, I'd like oh, to yeah. hear from you. Oh, yeah, yeah. You oh, how how could we do it uh, otherwise, which is, which is very... The, when I present my, my work to, to the French uh, authorities, because sometimes they invite me, and the INSEE invited me, it was very strong, very hard, for three hours. And the only thing I said was the fact that I think that it is a catastrophe, the fact that there is no plurality of thought within the INSEE anymore. But this is, uh, this is the, the fight I have for my whole life. This is the problem of economists, of the economist uh, 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 community, which is completely univocally uh, neoclassical. But we, we have the same, the same thing within the INSEE. So the first thing should be that they, they hire you as a heterodox in the INSEE or the ONS uh, later. But this, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really, I mean, it's a, it's a democratic question. It's not only a, a question of corporatism or knowing what you will become later. It's truly really a question of democracy. We need to have discussions and different points of view within the national statistics itself. And the second idea I, I, I propose them is to have sort of, a, of f hybrid forums, you know, sort of a agoras, concerning the way we measure quality and up until where we go, how far we go to measure the question of quality and who decide what counts and what matters. Because if we have tomatoes uh, this, uh, available the whole year, should we say that it's more quality? And who should say that? And for the moment they rely especially or essentially they rely on the prescriptors and who are the prescriptors? The producers themselves. And the producer, they always want to say that the quality is increasing. <laughs> Obviously, they won't say when it's, there is a degradation. So plurality, plurality, plurality. Pluralism. Please, go on. So in your presentation, you said that uh, in the measurement of inflation, uh, the basket of goods uh, is no longer being associated to the, to the working class households. Yeah, um, it's and that the average consumer. To the average consumer. Um, and that there is a kind of a gap between the perception of the people concerning yeah. inflation and the measurement mm. of inflation. And I was wondering how does it translate now with the current inflation and, mm. trans and also with like also the current protests uh, that are, I think, gonna becoming stronger mm. also over the next months. And also, do you think something like a CGT index could happen now, okay. today? Still, like, I feel like also unions are 
are talking about inflation a lot right now. I think that part of the yellow jacket uh, struggles that you may have heard about in France is linked to their perception, the idea of uh, what the narrative of the, the public narratives do, do not concern them anymore. I mean, and, and, and the narrative of inflation also. And I think it's, it's worsening these days because of the question of, uh, of uh, w what are the goods whose prices is increasing the most today? Alimentary goods, so food and energy. And these are the two uh, categories whose weight within the basket is higher for the, for the poor than for the rich. So obviously there will be an increased discrepancy between the perception and the national inflation in the month to come. And it's already the case. Now, it's not the CGT anymore, but you have alternatives. The two alternatives I have, uh, three alternatives I've seen the last month, Le Monde. So the newspaper Le Monde is producing its own indicator. So it's very strange, but he, he has the, uh, done a sort of partnership with a marketing agency who is selling probably to Le Monde again its own data, three times, four times, etc. Okay, so this is probably for, 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 for profit reasons of these uh, marketing agencies. The second is uh, the Consumer Association, UFC Que Choisir. He's uh, producing its own index. It has started in, uh, uh, in, in, in April 2022. And I meet them next week to know how they produce it. So another interview how they produce it and why they, they, they wanted to do it now and, and what, what is the use of their index, what they want to do with it. It's higher than the national, of, uh, the national index. And, and on, on France, France Info with a sort of individual simulator. So I think that for me, it means that the trade unions who should be part of the game are not part anymore of the game. They have no means no even cognitive means to, to work on that anymore. Sorry to say that, but it's true. I like them very much, but it's true. And they have no resources enough. Uh, they, they, they wait for students to help them, by the way. And, and, the, second, uh, and the second thing is the fact that there, are, um, a multi there is a multiplication of, the, of the, the sources and places of calculation. And this is what Alain Desrosières uh, described as being uh, very expressive of the neoliberalism. So I think we are, I mean, we are very much en plein. <laughs> we are really at the heart of the neoliberalism with the multiplication of different indicators. Concerning Argentina, I didn't say anything, but it's interesting because there are many, many papers more, more written by um, economic historians than economists or sociologists working on the measurement of inflation in Argentina, especially Cecilia Lanates Briones. She worked, she, she did very, very good jobs concerning Argentina, but we, we also sometimes work together and what she says is quite compatible with what I say. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.